We are close to the end of the book of Genesis. And we are going to look at Genesis chapters 49 and 50. So let us pray and then go to it. Lord, we thank you so much for blessing us again, guiding us through the study of the book of Genesis. And we pray that you will uh, enlighten our hearts and minds again, that we will be able to comprehend and to also apply the teachings of your word in Jesus' name through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Genesis 49 is a very interesting chapter. It is a chapter of Jacob's blessings on his sons. The arrangement of the chapter of the blessing section is very interesting because this is how you have the sons of Jacob arranged. You have first the sons of Leah, then at the end you have Rachel, and you may say all good up to this point because Leah was the one to give birth first. The first four sons of Jacob came through Leah, and then the last two came through Rachel. After Leah, Bilhah comes, and that's not weird because that's the order in which they gave birth. After Leah gave birth several times, Rachel said, I'm going to give Bilhah to my husband so he will have children via her. But what is weird is that only one of Bilhah's sons is mentioned here, and then Bilhah appears again on the other side with the other son. And then, right in the middle here, Zilpah appears. And Zilpah had two sons, Gad and Asher. To me, it is pretty challenging to understand why this arrangement. Why in this arrangement of the blessings, the maid of the not loved or unloved wife is placed right in the middle, like in the focal point of the structure, the sons of Zilpah. One possible explanation may be that God kind of wants to give you the understanding that his eyes are on the neglected and marginalized. Because Leah was not loved. Now, her maid was probably loved even less than Leah. And yet, God gives those two sons of Zilpah a special attention. So this is how you have uh, the numbers. Number one, two, three, and four, so the order of the sons, then nine and ten. Those are the sons of Leah. Four and then two later. Bilhah's son, first son, Dan, is the fifth in the row. Okay? Then Zilpah's two sons are seventh and eighth. Bilhah's other son is sixth. And then you have 11 and 12, Rachel's two sons. I'm just emphasizing this 
to see that obviously Bilhah's two sons are placed on one side and the other so that you can see that there is a structure, there is something intentional about it, pointing to these people right here. And these two sons are Gad and Asher. Now, the story. The story says that when Jacob grew old, and now Jacob is close to 147. Remember, he comes down to Egypt at the age of 130. And he spends in Egypt 17 years, the same amount of years that he spent with Joseph at the beginning of the story. So at 130, he gets to Egypt, spends there 17 years. At one point, the text mentions in chapter 48, verse 1, that he is sick. That's the context in which Joseph brings his two sons to him to bless them. And then 49 says, And Jacob called his sons and said, Gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days, says my translation. Another translation may be in the days to come. Some would even argue that this whole chapter 49 refers from a prophetic standpoint all the way to the end. But the text seems to give the impression that is, it's not the end, end in view, it is days to come. So from the perspective of when Jacob is doing what he's doing, the things that are happening to his sons or are going to happen to his sons are going to be in the future. So it's a prophetic blessing slash curse situation. Why do I say blessing slash curse? Because if you read all the 12 blessings, you will see that two of them really receive blessings. You can say that Judah, he receives blessings. And Joseph, he also is blessed. Then there are a few where hmm, it seems to be very general, and you can take it one way or the other. But there's also a few of them that are cursed. If you just read it with the 21st century mind. With all that, look at what verse 28 says. Verse 28 in chapter 49 is right after the blessings are done. It says... All these are the 12 tribes of Israel, and this is what their father spoke to them. And he blessed them. The word in Hebrew is barak. Barak means blessing. He blessed each one according to his own blessing. So in that verse 28, the word barak is mentioned three times. So obviously, somehow, all of these speeches of Jacob, all of the words that he placed on his sons, are to be taken as blessings. Even if, at first sight, they seem to be curses in some instances. Let me give you a very interesting situation in another book of the Bible. You know the book of Job. And there is that moment there when after Job is hit heavily by all kind of calamities, his wife comes to him and says something to him. You remember what she says? She says, what? Curse God 
Most translations say, curse God and die. What is interesting, however, is that the Hebrew text says, Barak God, bless God and die. Now, is that the same? Well, if it's used ironically, like, uh, like all right, bless God and go, then the meaning of it is curse, right? It's like, say something to him and just leave. I'm just using this example to illustrate that something similar may be going on here. Because in a Hebrew mindset, the word barak can be something positive, but it can be something negative as well. So it shouldn't surprise us, shock us, that some of the sons of Jacob are not blessed in the terms of something very positive being told them. And yet, they are blessed in the sense that whatever their father says about them, it will come to a fulfillment. Now, the first son, biologic son that is mentioned, is Reuben. And that is normal because he is the firstborn. He is right here, Reuben. Correct? Is he blessed or cursed? Let's read. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Unstable as water, you shall not excel. So what is it? You shall not excel because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. We can say a lot of good things about Reuben, or at least at the surface, it looks like he did a lot of good things. When the brothers wanted to kill Joseph, he said, uh, no, no, let's put him in the pit thinking that later on he will be able to get him out and send him home. But he was the firstborn. He should have stepped up for him instead of trying to work around and uh, somehow fool away his brothers from doing harm to his brother. Then we have him later on when he wants to take responsibility in front of Jacob and he wants to take care of Benjamin if his father is going to send him with them to Egypt. And what does Jacob do? He says, mm -mm, no, he's not going with you. But remember, at that point, Reuben had disappointed when uh, he kind of abandoned Joseph in the pit. And by the time he came back, the other brothers got him out and sold him into slavery because Judah came with the brilliant idea. But at the same time, Reuben also slept with Bilhah, this lady here. And that's why Jacob says he went up into my bed. So obviously, he is the firstborn, but he is not going to be treated as the firstborn. So is it a blessing or a curse? Well, not very positive when your father tells you, yeah, your excellency the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power, unstable as water, you shall not excel. Simeon and Levi, brothers, these two here, what Jacob says about them is very representative of who they are. 
instruments of cruelty in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter their council. Let not my honor be united to their assembly. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they hamstrung an ox. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Blessing or curse? Well, not very positive, again, because these two people, you remember probably the story when the two brothers, Simeon and Levi, went into the city of Shechem and killed all the males of the city. Uh, later on, Simeon is practically dissolved among the 12 tribes, and Levi, although they will become the priests, they will have no inheritance in the land, really, and they will be scattered among the people as well. And that's how we get to Judah. And there is a focus on Judah, all aglow, all beautiful, lots of messianic thoughts. Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. It sounds as if it was given to Joseph, although this is Judah. So he will be elevated. Judah is a lion. And you know later on in the book of Revelation, chapter 5, the lion is mentioned again. Jesus is the lion from the tribe of Judah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. And that name, Shiloh, seems to be a direct reference to the Messiah himself. So, Judah definitely receives a blessing and he is elevated to the position where he will continue the story of salvation all the way down to the Messiah. Because out of the 12 tribes of Jacob, Judah is the one that continues the Abrahamic covenant, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and now Judah. What's interesting in the story is that on the other side of the chiasm, the big chiasm, you have it on the back of your page, you have that moment when Judah gets into that illicit sexual relationship with Tamar. And that is exactly on the other side. It's like this. Judah is blessed here, And Judah is a miserable guy over here. The contrast clearly shows that Judah did repent. Yes, the same Judah that we know for his immorality. The same Judah that came up with the idea of selling Joseph into slavery. Later on becomes the intercessor of Benjamin in front of Joseph, the governor of Egypt. And it seems that Jacob recognizes that this guy, although he had a very reprobable character before, changed, and now he's elevated to the position of the firstborn, so to speak. A position which he actually shares with Joseph. So then you have the other brothers, Zebulun, Issachar, Dan, Gad, Naphtali, and we reach Joseph. Joseph is a fruitful bough by a well. His branches run over the wall. The archers have bitterly grieved him. 
shot at him and hated him, but his bow remained in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From there is he shepherd the stone of Israel. And the blessing continues. A beautiful blessing on Joseph. So Joseph is blessed. Benjamin is also blessed. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. Is that good? Is that bad? Hard to say. What we know from history later on is that Benjamin was almost eradicated as a nation, as a tribe. And we'll see that later on in the book of uh, Judges. When the Benjaminites got into some immorality things and they were almost eliminated as a tribe from among God's people. So after Jacob does what he does, and then he asks them to be taken up to Canaan and buried there, you have that little chiasm, the burial of the patriarchs. He wants to be buried in the same grave where Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah and Leah is also buried. Something strange again. Although he loved Rachel throughout his life more than Leah, Rachel was buried at Ramah on the way when Benjamin was born. And Jacob gets to be buried with Leah, not with Rachel. Now, how is that? Pretty complicated life, right? Then chapter 50 speaks about the burial arrangements for Jacob or Israel. And it's interesting that he gets a state funeral. Something similar to what the queen got the other day. This is amazing if you just read the text and try to get into the picture of what is presented there. It's not only his family that does the funeral. No. Joseph goes to the Pharaoh and Pharaoh says, yeah, go and fulfill the desire of your father. But the way it's done is just beyond the comprehension. Verse 7. So Joseph went up to bury his father and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh. All the servants of Pharaoh? The elders of his house, all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as all the house of Joseph, his brothers and his father's house. Only their little ones, their flocks and their herds, they left in the land of Goshen. Just imagine what kind of procession is that. Egypt is somewhere down here, and they have to go all the way up here. Days, probably weeks, of marching in a procession like that. And then they pass the Jordan. Say, here you have the Jordan River. They cross the Jordan, and uh, there they do some mourning. Seven days of mourning done by Joseph and uh, the people of the land see what is happening and they even rename the place verse 11 therefore its name was called Abel Mitzrayim which is beyond the Jordan and Abel Mitzrayim means morning of Egypt so the people of the land saw how all Egypt was 
up there in their land doing some big mourning. So you may ask, okay, so since they are already up there, are they now going to come back to Egypt, these Israelites? Because their place is up here. That's where they are supposed to go. And Joseph, according to the final verses of chapter 50, reminds them of what God had spoken to Jacob in chapter 46 in a vision that he will go back to Canaan. Not him personally being alive, but his people, his family. So you may think, hey, since you had this funeral of Jacob, then you should just pack up, all of you, get the body of the defunct in a cart, in a hearse, and let's go all the way up and stay there because now the famine is over. This is way after the five years of famine because they came down to Egypt when the second year of famine was on. There came five more years. But according to the text, Jacob lives in Egypt 17 years. 17 minus 5, that is 12 years after the famine is over. They could have theoretically go home. Only that, remember, there was a prophecy given uh, to Abraham centuries ago as to when and who will come back to take possession of the land. And God also spoke to Jacob, according to chapter 46, and told him, you are going down there, I'm going down with you there, I'm going to make you a big nation there in Egypt, and then you will be brought up again, you will be brought out of here. And that's exactly what the conversation of uh, Joseph is with his brothers. He says in verse 24, chapter 50, so after they come back from the funerals of Jacob, which is a long state funeral, I think if I'm not wrong, they spend like 70 days total with this. They come back. And now Joseph is about to die, and he says, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land of which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So, just as Jacob asks them to be buried in Canaan, Joseph, now the son, says, hey, I'm going to die. But when God visits you, in the sense of God is going to take you out of this country, take my body, because they bombed him, they embalmed him, and uh, put him in a coffin, it doesn't say that he was placed in a pyramid. But he was placed in a coffin. The coffin had to be kept somewhere. It's hard to even imagine how when they had a chance to leave. Because you know, at one point, later on in the book of Exodus, they have a chance to leave. You may think, okay, so where was Joseph that during the night when they were eventually in the position of leaving, they could get the coffin and take him. Hard to say. But the text says later on that they took indeed Joseph and brought him back to Canaan to bury him there. So that's how the story of Genesis ends. Joseph, the guy that brought them down to Egypt, is in a coffin. 
I mean, can you finish the story like this? Well, the story is not done because then the book of Exodus comes. But I want to point out something very interesting. Before this moment when Joseph asked them to take him out of Egypt, when God visits them and bury him up there in Canaan. In this section between 15 and 21, verses 15 and 21, chapter 50, after Jacob is gone, so Jacob is the patriarch, the patriarch is gone, he blessed his sons, the state funeral took place, now everybody is back in the land, and now his brothers, the brothers that sold him, they start thinking, man, that is gone now. The patriarch is out. Now this guy, he's gonna pay us back now. Now his time has come. He didn't do it while daddy was still around, but now you will see. Now you will see how he will pay us back for all the evil we did to him. So they send to Joseph. It seems they send a messenger to Joseph. This is what they tell him. Before your father died, he commanded, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now, we don't know if Jacob ever told them to do that or not. But it seems that they are still afraid of the possibility that now the younger brother, not the youngest because Benjamin is youngest, Joseph is the second youngest, but now the young brother, the governor of Egypt, the big guy, the politician, is going to give it to us. So they come with a story, which we don't know if it's true or not, that dad told us, this is what you should tell him after I'm gone. Forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. The servants of the God of your father. That sounds good, right? And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. This is the last time we know that Joseph wept. He wept several times. Here again he weeps. He probably remembers lots of things. Or maybe he weeps because he thinks, oh poor brothers. You think I am the way you think I am? Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face. And this is the third time we have the picture of his brothers falling down before his face. Just like he saw that in his dreams. And they said, behold, we are your servants. You can also translate by, we are your slaves. And Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. He knew they were afraid. For am I in the place of God? What does that mean? If you try to understand that sentence in a Hebraic way, it seems that the question, am I in the place of God, kind of gives you the impression, Joseph tells them, hey, if somebody is to punish you, it's not me. It's God. Is the punishment already included in the blessings and curses of Jacob? Maybe, at least partially. Am I in the place of God? Verse 20. But as for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people 
alive. And then he assures them, I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. The Hebrew says, spoke to their hearts. What a beautiful character, right? There's a moment before when uh, Joseph comes out and uh, tells them who he is. It's 45 verses 5 through 8. When again and again Joseph says, God sent me here. God sent me here before you. He says in verse 5, For God sent me before you to preserve life. Verse 7, And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth. And again, verse 8, It was not you who sent me here, but God. Verse 9, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. So again and again, Joseph says, it wasn't me, it wasn't you, it was God. But here, when they come with this message of forgive your servants the trespass of your brothers and their sins, for they did evil to you, he does not downplay the evil side. He doesn't say, well, you know, the evil you did was actually good. Uh -uh, that's not what he says. What he says is, yes, you did evil, but God meant what you meant for evil, meant it for good, which is a different kind of deal. So this is what it means. There are situations in life when somebody does evil to you. The evil is done to you personally, individually. All the evil goes to you. Then God takes that evil, turns it around, and he makes it a blessing for you, and not only for you, but also for others. And I think that is amazing, right? Questions? Good question. We see the code, the special code that Jacob prepares for Joseph, and that is uh, chapter 37. So the question is, what is the significance of that special code? Chapter 37, verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. So Joseph is special to him because he was the son of his old age. Also he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and, and could not speak peaceably to him. We don't have a detailed description of the significance of the coat. What we know, however, is that when they saw him, verse 23, so it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. And they took him and cast him into a pit. Later on, they take the tunic, verse 31, so they took Joseph's tunic, killed the kid of the goats, and dipped the tunic in the blood. So the tunic comes back again and again. First when he wears it, then when they strip him of the tunic, and then when they take the tunic and dip it in the blood of uh, a goat, of a kid. So what is the significance of the tunic? Although we don't have it described in details here, it's obvious from the context that that tunic or something about that tunic represents status. Status in front of the brothers, status in society, 
in those days, somewhat different, but not totally different from today, certain people dressed in a certain way. We just saw the royal family of England these days because they were in the center of attention. And uh, you could see a certain kind of dressing, a certain kind of walking, a certain kind of uh, acting. Even today, if you go to Africa, for instance, they will be able to tell you, this is just a simple set of clothes. But this one is high ranking. So from the context, that's what my deduction is, that it represented some sort of status. I'm not sure they saw any kind of threatening feature in it, as if now Joseph is the firstborn in daddy's mind because he gave him the colorful tunic. I'm not going that far, but they had a problem not only with the kid, but also with the clothes. They stripped the clothes down. That represented something. In the longer application, the foreshadowing or type of Jesus Christ, same process that you can see in uh, Joseph's story happens with Jesus. At least some elements of it. You remember that Jesus was stripped of his... Uh, tunic, and then uh, they cast dies who will take that one piece of uh, garment. So that somehow prefigures what will later happen with uh, Jesus Christ. And obviously, clothes also have this spiritual significance of uh, being clothed or dressed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ later on. So I believe this is somehow, the, the motive of the clothes is somehow a continuation of the first instance in the Bible when somebody provides clothes. You remember that moment? When Adam and Eve sin, they try to put on some clothes, some uh, manufactured leafy clothes, and then God comes and gives them skin clothes. So somehow in that whole symbolism of clothes, I think Joseph's clothes can also be seen as a significant moment. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so the question is, since we know that Joseph died at 110, what do we know about the other brothers? When did they die? We don't know. By the time they leave Egypt, of course they are dead. Because according to the prophecy of, uh, that God gave to Abraham, it was the fourth generation that was going to go back to Canaan. Okay, so all this generation passed away. Now then, you would ask, okay, so what happened to their bodies? Because we only know about Joseph that he was taken up to Canaan. We don't know. And uh, there is a debate we'll see next week, some elements. Where should we start the fourth generation? Should we start the fourth generation with the moment that they moved down to Egypt or later? What does it mean, a generation in that context? It's pretty difficult to understand. But by the time when God uses Moses, and that's going to be the next storyline in the book of Exodus, obviously this generation is all past. We'll see next time also how the age span goes down from, say, Adam all the way to Joseph. Joseph seems to have died very early. Everybody else in his family, as far as we know, lived longer than Joseph. 
Good question. So 12 is a multiple of 6, 6 plus 6. Is there any significance in that number in 6 or in 12? Or double that, and that's 24. I believe yes. I'm not sure we know everything about those significances. But when you look at the creation process, you have six. And on the sixth day, humans are created. And then the seventh day is the day of rest, God's day. So there is some significance coming from that moment. Then you have 12 twice. You have 12 in the Old Testament, the 12 tribes of uh, Jacob. Same is repeated in the New Testament. You have the 12 apostles. But at the same time, in the New Testament, Israel, a new Israel, which also includes the pagans, grafted into the stock of uh, historic Israel, they also, being an Israel, are represented in the book of Revelation, chapter 7, as being 12 tribes, with some differences compared to the 12 tribes that appear in chapter 49. For instance, Dan is missing altogether. We obviously have something in the 6, something more in the 12, but then we also have 24, which is 24 elders in the book of Revelation, 24 being uh, 12 plus 12. In my view, the way I understand the significance of uh, the 24, 24 is some sort of representation of uh, God's universal family. God's universal family includes humans as intelligent beings, but not only humans. I believe, based on the Bible, although scientifically it is very hard to support the idea, biblically it seems that there are intelligent beings, unfallen beings, in some other parts of the universe. Scientifically, we know there is exobiolo exobiology, but exobiology is a science that tries to study the potential of life outside of planet Earth, which up to this point is very hard to sustain. Even uh, Mars they say would need to be terraformed to make it friendly for human life. Because at this point, Joe or Janet has no chance to survive anywhere else in the universe outside of some artificial cabins or machines that they send into the universe. So 24 seems to be a representation of uh, God's universal family. Twelve seems to be God's earthly family. And six seems to be the individual created by God. Or the first human family, Adam and Eve. I would see both of them somehow represented by the six. Six can also be seen uh, negatively in the 666 as uh, the symbol of humans elevated and placed in the place of God's seven. So in that context, the 666 in the book of Revelation chapter 13 obviously is negative, right? What do you think about this concept of a parent blessing or cursing their child? More specifically, 
the father. Because in biblical context, it is the father that does that. What do you think about that? What do you make of it? Does that apply even today? If we curse our children, are they cursed? If we bless them, are they blessed? Naturally, you would say that uh, Christians, Seventh-day Adventists, they will bless their children. But haven't you ever heard a parent cursing their children? I have. And it seems to me that although we have kind of forgotten the parental responsibility and the impact of what a parent, a parent's words can have on the life of their descendants, of um, their children, I think somehow it has to apply. There is a very interesting passage, Proverbs 26, verse 2. Like a flitting sparrow. Have you seen a sparrow? What is a, a flitting? Flitting. It's a sparrow that jumps from one place to the other. Like a flying swallow, so a curse without cause shall not alight. Meaning, somebody sends out a curse and it will not land on the person that is cursed unless it has a cause. How does that apply? What if a parent really has a cause for a certain curse? See, Jacob's situation. Does God take in account what a parent says? Because I strongly believe what the parents do and what the parents say does have an impact on the life of their children. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for bringing to our attention so many interesting things from the life of uh, Jacob or Israel Joseph, his brothers, and we thank you for your blessings on our lives. And if there is any responsibility that we should be aware of when it comes to blessing others, I pray, Lord, that you will let us understand that. In Jesus' name, through the Holy Spirit, amen.